A lot of the, uh, of the graduate programs you have to do a, a DI statement, right? If you don't agree with, uh, with this political litmus test, you still have to do it if you want to get in. Um, so there is something to be said to be, you know, careful with what you say for sure. Luana Maroja, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, so you've written a lot about the growing political and ideological polarization within academia. Uh, can you explain what you think happened there and how it affected your work as a biologist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my first hint that something was off, was off, it was like soon after the election of Donald Trump, I started to notice resistance in the classroom to learn certain topics uh, from heritability, King selection, um, you know, you know things that I never noticed before. And then within a year, we started to have these invitations of speakers, and uh, we had a speaker come and called for restrictions in speech, and saying that who can and cannot speak needs to be written on a stone, decided by the administration, and the students were applauding that, like. One student questioned it, everybody else applauded, and that's when I saw that something was really off, and yeah. Yeah, and you, you talked about how uh, each of us kind of sometimes reaches a tipping point with that, and you said, quote, the moment you realize that social justice is no longer what we thought it was, but has instead morphed into an ugly authoritarianism, what was kind of like your tipping point? My tipping point was this, this talk that uh, you know, Reza Islam ha came to campus and was calling for speech restrictions. And the no name of the talk was, uh, the future of free speech was the name of the, of the talk. Um, and uh, that was the moment that I, I walked out truly horrified. I grew up during dictatorship in Brazil and the idea that people actually wanted to be censored was like, that doesn't make any sense. And do you, are you optimistic that there will be more and more people kind of reaching this tipping point and kind of rethinking, you know, what do I stand for and maybe kind of opening their minds to what academic freedom is about? Or are you more kind of pessimistic based on your experience? I am actually very optimistic. I, I actually see more and more people reaching this tipping point. People come to talk to me oftentimes, like without wanting to be open about that, but agreeing that um, there are problems, um, and they are starting to observe problems inside their own departments, colleges, universities, and, and I think that's good. Uh, you know, it brings people close to the next step, which is speaking out against it. And what are some examples of how this ideology, or ideology in general, how does it kind of uh, encroach on the scientific method or the scientific discipline? At first, I thought that the sciences would be more or less spared. When I was uh, looking at, you know, problems spreading in my college, it was mostly in the humanities. Um, I do not believe that's the case now. I do believe that uh, it's spreading into sciences as well, uh, especially biology. Um, biology is always a hotbed for controversial things. If it's not creationist, <laughs> intelligent design, and all these other things, it's now. You know, whether there are differences between humans would be a big controversial topic that uh, biologists can somehow address. So I, I do see the, the, the intrusion of ideology into sciences as well. What do you think we can do to kind of recover the spirit of the pursuit of truth in biology specifically? Like, do you think there's something that the discipline itself can do or that scholars can do to kind of help recover this culture? I think ultimately everything will depend on uh, having the ethics, right? So, so you know, just because uh, even if there are differences between populations, sexes, etc., it does not mean that we should treat people differently. So, you know, the highest moral ground is knowing that even in the face of differences, people are people and they need to be treated equally. And that kind of, that reminds me of the whole debate that we have now between, you know, merit and identity politics and so on, what, what do you think we can do to kind of um, 
make the university more committed to merit and less kind of obsessed with identity politics? Um, Is there something we could do in admissions or? You know? Yeah, so I, I don't do admissions and I don't know all that goes in. I think that, uh, you know, having as objective as possible evaluations is the best. You know, I, I don't believe that, uh, you know, in view of the affirmative action debates nowadays, I don't see affirmative action as you either go to college or you don't go to college. It's more about whether you go to Harvard or you don't go to Harvard, you go to some other colleges. And in my opinion, it's much better to be matched with your colleagues than being the, the, the lowest achieving one. You know, I, I, uh, I can't imagine, for example, if I was placed in a, in a physics classroom with people that knew uh, a lot more math than me, was more, more comfortable with math, I would probably drop out, I wouldn't be able to follow, and I would feel like really bad in that class, whereas if I match it, then you know, my interest in the discipline will be much stronger, I'm able to continue learning. So I think you know, Harvard doesn't offer a better education per se. You know, what Harvard has is that it picks students that are scoring highest. That's why it appears to offer a better education. But it's about the students, not about the education that it offers. So if you are in a group that is more matched with you, we'll get more out of, the, out of your education than if you are unmatched. And what advice do you have for budding biologists or young biology students who agree with you, but they see all around them a lot of pressures to conform or to say certain things or to use certain language or to you know, toe the party line, so to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, do you, mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you have for them? They might agree with you, but they're also concerned about their career. So. Oh, and they have reasons to be concerned, right? I think that, um, you know, like um, a lot of even like graduate schools now, like if you're not applying to graduate schools, a lot of the, uh, of the graduate programs you have to do a, a DI statement, right? And if you don't agree with, uh, with this political litmus test, you still have to do it if you want to get in. Um, so there is something to be said, to be, you know, careful with what you say for sure, um, how you resist things. Um, and you know, I think following your passion in biology is essential. Like you know, you you wanna you wanna you know. I, I think all biologists are fascinated by nature, and, and I don't want to let that die. So I want biologists to continue to be fascinated by nature. I do not want to discourage anyone to continue pursuing an education. And I do hope that we are gonna uh, turn a corner and leave these uh, ideological, you know, pressures behind, and people will be inclusive and welcoming to all independent of their political views. So we're here uh, in Dallas at the Forbidden Courses summer program and for the last week you've been teaching this seminar called The Invasion of Ideology into Evolutionary Biology. Can you tell us a little bit about just the seminar and your experience this week? Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I had a lot of fun with the students, you know, it's a, it's a very unique bunch. The students are not biologists, they are from all walks. There is some biologists actually, but most are not. Uh, so this was aimed for a no major uh, group of students and I think they got a lot of our, out of it. Uh, we talked about, you know, from gender binaries to the existence or not of races in humans, um, uh, explaining what biologically that those, those things would mean. Um, sex binary, not gender binary, mm -hmm. sex binary. Um, and uh, it, we had amazing discussions. We had debates every day. So it was it was a fascinating experience. Like and and the openness that you can say things here that wouldn't be welcome in other places. And what did you? Why did you decide to kind of accept this offer to teach at UATX and become involved in UATX? Um, so in part for my own growth, like to learn how to talk to the public about ideas that can be seen as controversial. In, in fact, they are pretty straightforward biological ideas, but nowadays they, they have become controversial, like sexes are binary, for example, is a good example of a non-controversial and yet controversial idea. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an excellent experience to, to learn to teach non-major students. Um, and, and Yeah. And how, um, last question, I, I'm wondering, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of kind of, uh, loss of trust in major institutions and also in experts who 
uh, know a lot about biology or mm -hmm. presumably know a lot about biology with COVID and whatnot. Do you have any advice in general for like a consumer of news and advice and, you know, um, you know, pandemics, whatever, how do we know whether something is true or not as kind of consumers? Do you have any kind of advice for how the culture more generally and society more generally can kind of discern between truthful information and, and false information? That's a real tricky one. Because yeah. if someone is completely naive, right, like, yeah. you know, you need to get some facts to be able to inform. Like when the masks got started, right? You know, right. My first question is like, the virus is tiny, microscopic. How can any fabric of any sort block a virus, right? Yeah. And then, you know, but at the beginning I didn't know, well, maybe the N95, you know, and then data starts to come out, the, the first studies trying to prove it, no difference, no difference. So it's like, okay, my intuition was correct. You know, probably it makes no difference. Um, you know, and I think I never took an extreme position, for example, refusing to use masks altogether. I, you know, my college required masks. I didn't complain, I used masks. You know, I think that the costs versus benefit, you have to weigh where the costs, where are the benefits, right, of uh, resisting masks, for example. You know, it's minimum, minimum cost to use it, you know. Um, if it makes people really uncomfortable, then why are you gonna go there? So I think like, in, in some ways, not being extreme in face of things that are not certain yet is, is a good approach. Um, vaccines, right? You know, when the vaccines start coming out and you see the, the, it is protective to many people, it saves many lives, right? Um, it also has a risk for younger people. So, you know, it's, it's what you need to wait for the data to start coming out and then you can, you know, weigh the costs and benefits. There is always costs and benefits. So what's the cost? What's the benefit of these actions, right? Or in lockdowns and all these things, right? Yeah, so it sounds like not being too absolutist one way or another and just being a discerning, rational human and being. And waiting for data waiting. to come in and yeah. <laughs> see yeah. where things are going, yeah. yeah. Luana, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.